Hello, welcome to NAFA Live. I'm your host, Zach Hules. We have a great speaker lined up for you this morning from our host location in Ashland, Nebraska. Some of you are joining us virtually, while others are joining us from one of the 18 WASH locations across Arizona, Nebraska, Indiana, Iowa, Minnesota, and North Dakota. If this is your first NAFA Live, welcome. If you're a regular, welcome back. And if you're not a NAFA member, then an especially warm welcome to you. If you enjoyed today's presentation and you want more informa information about NAFA, please talk to your watch party location host or email us at recruitment at NAFA.org. And speaking of watch parties, let's take a moment to see who's out there. Hi. Everyone, welcome to your NAFA meeting. Now, before we begin the program, I have a few housekeeping items to go over. Today, two CE credits have been approved for participants in Alabama, Arizona, Washington, D.C., Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Louisiana, Maryland, Maine, Minnesota, Nebraska, North Dakota, Virginia, and Wisconsin. For those of you joining us virtually from those states with the intention to earn CE credits, you must remain present for the duration of the program. Throughout the program, polling questions will appear on your screen and you'll have two minutes to answer them in order to attain the CE credit. And speaking of which, the first polling question for individual viewers is, how many years have you been in the business? How many years have you been in the business? Please use the polling function on your screen to respond. You have two minutes. And as always, NAFA Live will be held every month. So please mark your calendar for the next meeting on September 13th, which will be live streamed from the NAFA Performance Plus Purpose Conference in Orlando. This meeting will feature big idea speaker, Danny O'Connell presenting how to turn your successful practice into a balanced personal life. And now without further ado, it is my great pleasure to turn the program over to NAFA Nebraska president, Brad Broderson, who will introduce our speaker. Brad, take it away. Thank you, Zach. Welcome NAFA members. NAFA Nebraska is pleased to host the eighth in a series of monthly NAFA live events. It is my pleasure as NAFA Nebraska State President to introduce our speaker today, David Holstrom. David is co-founder and Chief Investment Officer of Financial Architects. He's earned his MBA, CFP, CFA, and the whole list of acronyms of all the groups that he belongs to. David talks about that if those designations, along with his degrees, um, all counted towards a degree, he would have more degrees than a thermometer. David has served as an arbitrator, expert witness in security disputes, uh, taught numerous courses nationwide for CPAs, financial planners, investment managers, and so forth. He's been published in Financial Planning and Investment Wealth Magazine, author of numerous white papers, he is the recipient of the 2015 Honors Award contributing to the financial planning industry from the Financial Planning Association in Georgia. All the way from Georgia, here live from Nebraska, let's give him a big NAFA welcome for David Holstrom. Thank you. Thank you very much. I always enjoy coming. I don't I speak in the Midwest more often than I would have expected I would end up speaking in the Midwest. And so I've been to Omaha several times for the Nebraska Wealth Management Conference. I did some continuing education classes for CPAs. Apparently, it's just across the interstate. At, uh, there's a public park or something or other, and I, I've been there. Um, I've spoken in um, Wichita the last three years running to an FPA event, which um, in Midwest distances is close. In East Coast distances, that's really far away, but for you guys, I think that's considered next door. Um, and people are always just so nice, and I, I, I can't decide why. I think there's two possible reasons. I think both are probably true. One is people in the Midwest are just nice people. And the second one is anybody actually shows up from out of town, you're just happy that <laughs> somebody would come. <laughs> so anyway, I'm really happy to be here, and, and I hope uh, we have a good time this morning. And um, you know, instructors always say this, but you know, if you have questions or whatever, please feel free to ask them. It's, it's much more fun if this is interactive. Um, we are, we do have remote folks, as you know, so I'll try to repeat the questions. Uh, hopefully, I'll remember to do that. I'm mic'd up for the remote folks. I didn't get mic'd up for this room on the assumption that I can talk loud enough that the back can hear me. Is that true? Everybody can hear me fine, so I don't need a mic for in here. Okay, nobody said anything, so maybe I can't be heard in the back. I don't know. <laughs> um, I'll assume it's good until somebody complains. Um, anyway, so the first half of this 
we're going to talk about behavioral finance and decision making. And these are, are topics that I find very fascinating. Um, at the end of the day, what we sell to clients are not products or trades. It's wisdom. Our, our fundamental product is the quality of our decision making process. And so I have found behavioral finance fascinating and I started reading behavioral finance books before anybody knew what behavioral finance was. And it first sort of hit my radar screen in 2002 when Daniel Kahneman won the Nobel Prize in economics. And he claims that he doesn't know anything about economics. He's a psychologist. Um, and that's when sort of people say, well, what is this field? This is a new thing. Well, behavioral finance is the, is the intersection of psychology and economics. It's a study of how people make irrational decisions. Now, people making irrational decisions is not weird. People making consistent irrational decisions is weird. In other words, the economists have always assumed that everybody is perfectly rational, perfectly logical, Mr. Spock type people, right? For those of you who are old enough to remember Spock. Um, and if people make a suboptimal decision, the, the, the economists would say, well, they just made a mistake, right? Which is possible, We're, you know, we make mistakes. But if they make the same bad decision over and over and over in different realms, then you go, well, that's weird. That's not just a mistake. That's a persistent mistake. Something's actually wrong with the model. And so I start off with a bunch of sort of fun examples, but they apply to us and to our clients. And so people have asked me over the years, said, well, you study behavioral finance so that you can see where your clients are screwed up. I said, no, I study behavioral finance so I see where I'm screwed up, right? I can do a lot more damage to a bunch of people than they can to themselves because I'm spread across a bunch of people. <laughs> um, so let's get into this. So... In a longer session, I would actually have these, these upcoming questions on a piece of paper and have everybody answer them and take you know, 10 or 15 minutes and do it. And there's always somebody in the class who is uh, a really, really strong type A personality who's trying to get 100. And so I say, just guess. Your best guesses are fine. And they don't, they, so it takes way too long. So I can't do it. But I will show you what the questions are. So these are the questions I distribute. And I, I make sure I explain the instructions really clearly. For every one of these questions, there's an answer. But you don't have to give me the answer. You give me a range. Give me a low number and a high number where you are 90% sure that the true answer lies in between your low and your high, right? That's a pretty simple explanation, I think. And the questions are weird questions like, what's the population of San Diego, right? What year did Michelangelo complete the painting of the Sistine Chapel ceiling? What's the maximum weight in pounds of President William Howard Taft? He was the really, really fat one, got stuck in the bathtub in the White House. Um, what's the height of Mount Kosciuszko, uh, highest peak in Australia, and so forth? And there's 10 of these questions, right? They're all things that nobody knows. I'm pretty good at like Jeopardy stuff. I don't know these. <laughs> these are weird questions. And people taking the quiz don't know these. And they know that they don't know these. But I didn't tell them to give me a number. I told them to give me a range. So after we take the quiz, I have people swap with their neighbor, and then we grade them. If people gave a range where they were 90% sure that the true answer was in between their numbers, how many should they miss if there's 10 questions? One, right? I've done this thing a bunch of times. What do you think the average score is on the quiz? It should be a 90%. What do you think it actually is? 50% usually, something very close to 50%. Which is weird, and this is where I want us to sort of think for a minute. When asked for a 90% confidence interval on things where people know they don't know anything, they give a 50% confidence interval. Our overconfidence level is crazy. And it's worse if you think you know something, right? So if a client asks you, what do you think the market's going to do next year? My answer is probably somewhere between down 40% and up 50% based on historical data. <laughs> right? But everybody gives, I even saw, I, our, our Vanguard rep, uh, I emailed him and I said, you know, Vanguard just came out with their, their range for the stock market and the bond market for the next 10 years, their, their compound return expectation. And both of them had 2% lows and highs. Like, I don't remember what the numbers were, but like bonds were two to four and stocks were four to six or something like that. I said, okay, I'm, on the bonds, maybe I buy that, but there is no way 
that, I, and you guys are, I'm sure, are smart at Vanguard. There's no way you know within a 2% range the compound return on stocks over the next decade. Um, it's just nobody knows that. And this is my pitch to clients. My business partner says that I'm a terrible salesperson because this is my pitch to clients. I have no idea what's going to happen in the market. I don't know what the dollar's going to do. I don't know what interest rates going to do. I don't know what the market's going to do. Therefore, we should manage your money. Because <laughs> the other people don't know either, but they either don't know that they don't know or they're lying, and both those things are bad. <laughs> right? This overconfidence thing is the biggest finding out of behavioral finance. We are just overconfident all over the place. And men are worse than women. Women are still overconfident. Men are way worse. And professionals, uh, more educated people and so forth, um, are even more overconfident, even in realms that have nothing to do with your education. And men are really bad if it's something perceived as a male domain, like finance, auto repair, I don't know plumbing at something. Even if somebody knows nothing about it, right? You've, you know, it's seen like all the comics or whatever about some guy, you know, he's going to fix the plumbing himself. And then they have spent three times more than they would have on the plumber to fix the problem that he caused when he tried to do the plumbing. Um, I also, you guys remember the show Big Bang Theory? Um, there's one episode, they're driving in the car. You know, it's all these physicists, for those who don't know. They're driving in the car and the car breaks down and they get out and they pop the hood and these physicists are standing around looking at the engine and so they might know anything about internal combustion engines. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, simple, very simple technology. And they all understand the theory. So they might not have fixed one. No. <laughs> right? But anyway, we tend to be very overconfident. Let me give a different example. Here's another more questions. Again, in, in a group where I have a lot more time, I would actually do this. This would be anonymous. I would hand out a piece of paper, a little scrap of paper, maybe post it notes or something, and say, everybody write down, how much in today's dollars you think your net worth will be at retirement? Don't put your name on it. Second question, what do you think the average answer in the room is? Right? And then I collect them. They have no names on them. I tabulate them. <laughs> the first number is on average double the second number. Everybody thinks they're going to do twice as well as everybody else, right? <laughs> And this works, not, this works with advisors, it works with lawyers, it works with doctors, it works with any a group of lay people, church people, whatever. This, this question, it's funny, everybody thinks they're doing twice as well as everybody else. Um, so overconfidence. Here's another one. So this one, you have to set it up a, a slightly different way. And this question has been done a lot by the psychologists and the economists to, to tease it out. So what you do is you take a group of people like this room, and then we randomly select you into two subgroups, right? So you know, what instructors always do, they sort of split on the middle or something, but you, you really shouldn't do that. You should randomly pick people because people who sit on the left might be somehow different than people who sit on the right or whatever. We randomly select you into two groups. And the first group, we give them this question, right? Let's see my quarter in my pocket. You're given $1,000. Now, you have a choice after you get that $1,000. You can either take another $500 for sure, or I could flip a coin, fair coin, and if it comes up heads, you get 1,000. If it comes up tails, you get nothing. So you get the first 1,000 no matter what. Then you can either take 500 for sure, or you could flip for an additional 1,000 or zero. Right? Now, this is not a trick question yet. So go, everybody thinks I'm trying to fool them. This, no, no, no. This one's fine. This is straight up. Just answer like you normally would. How many of you just take the $500 for sure on that thing? Right. That is considered to be the correct answer by the economists. Because the expected return is the same both ways. Why would you take risk? Right? If you have 50-50 chance of 1,000 or nothing, that average is 500. Why don't you just take the 500? Right? Um, I get people who miss that when I ask that question because they think I'm trying to fool them. So they answer the opposite, thinking they're going to outsmart me, and then they just screw up my whole deal. All right. So then the other half of the group who did not hear the first question, so that's why I can't really do it here the same way. If you didn't hear the first question, they get asked this question. I give you $2,000. Now you have a choice. You can either pay me $500 for sure, or we can flip a coin, and if it comes up heads, you don't pay me anything. If it comes up tails, you pay me $1,000. People asked, now you guys are smart, right? You realize that's the exact same question. Exactly. I just worded it differently. People asked the second version of the question, we'll take the, coin, we'll take the flip overwhelmingly. We say a lot that people are risk averse, People are not really risk averse. They're loss averse, right? It's like, I've heard people sort of pick on standard deviations and say, well, I don't, nobody cares if the standard deviation is up. I only care about downside deviation, right? 
right? Volatility on the upside is cool, <laughs> right? People become risk-seeking in the face of losses. They also, I don't even think they're, they're loss-averse as much as they are regret-averse, right? So there's another sort of strand of the literature that shows that people want to avoid doing things where they would feel bad about their decisions later. And you guys have run into this in your professional lives. Somebody has a portfolio that they inherited from dear old dad and they didn't change anything in it for 20 years, right? It's just been sitting there. Well, why? Well, if they change something, that might be wrong. And if that was wrong and they lost money, they would feel stupid. If they just don't get around to changing dad's portfolio, <clears throat> they feel less stupid, even if that's wrong, right? Um, here's another one I'll use. I'll use some of you guys as an example. I'll use... Aaron and, and Karen, if you don't, guys don't mind. So um, Aaron owns a mutual fund, XYZ mutual fund, and he's had it for a while, and he thinks, you know, I don't think this fund is, is really all that good, so I think I'm going to consider selling it. So he reaches, searches it, looks into it, and says, yeah, this is not a good fund. I'm going to get out, and so he sells it. Karen does not own XYZ mutual fund, but she's thinking about it, and so she analyzes it and says, yeah, no, I don't think that's a very good fund. Uh, I'm not going to invest in that. And the XYZ fund over the next year doubles. Who's unhappier, Aaron or Karen? Aaron by a lot, right? Because he sold it. Errors of commission feel worse than errors of omission. <laughs> but that's illogical because they both made the exact same decision. They both decided not to own the fund. And so one of the things I think we even as professionals are prone to doing is there's a thing called the status quo bias in behavioral finance, where the position you already have, you have a higher tendency to stick with it than if you didn't have it. In other words, and you've heard people say this, but owning something is a decision to buy it, right? And not owning something is the same as a decision to sell it. But once something's in the portfolio, you tend not to make a decision. You tend not to look at it every day like, would I buy this today if I were in cash? And you've done this to clients. If you were in cash, would you have that portfolio? Right? You've all heard that technique. You just get people past the status quo bias. Um, incidentally, this, this people doubling down to get even is how Vegas makes money. <laughs> right? Because people will just keep betting. Because what you're doing here, people will take risks to try to get back to even. Right? And so that also explains people doubling down on losing positions in stocks. Have you ever noticed, this is an aside, have you ever noticed for every piece of stock market wisdom, there's an equal and opposite piece of stock market wisdom? Right? <clears throat> Cut your losses or double down. <laughs> no one ever went broke taking a profit. Let your winners run. <laughs> right? You ever noticed all the, all the wisdom? There's, there's two versions of all of it. Anyway. Um, but people do tend to sort of double down because the alternative is admitting you were wrong, <laughs> which we're sort of bad at doing. Right. Let's do another one. <clears throat> All right, suppose I gave you a choice. You have some, some job where, you know, you get fixed breaks. I know we all sort of work jobs. We take a break whenever we feel like it, go play golf or whatever. But um, if, you, if somebody's offered a 15-minute break today or a 20-minute break tomorrow, a reasonably high number of people would take the 15 minute break today. Like you can have a 15 minute break right now or tomorrow at this time, you can have a 20 minute break. There's a reasonably high number of people will take the 15 minutes right now. And that doesn't seem weird, right? But what if you were offered a 15 minute break a year from now or a 20 minute break a year and a day from now? Everybody picks the second option, right? There's nobody that picks the first option you realize that's the same question. It's what's your discount rate on breaks for a one-day period? <laughs> right? And so we, what we all tend to do is um, we have hyperbolic discounting is the technical term for it, which means that people's discount rates are different depending on how far in the future it is. So in the short run, people have really, really, really high discount rates. And in the long run, they're much, much lower. So people will put things on credit cards today. They won't plan to put something on a credit card in a year, right? Because the disc to get it now 
your discount rate is higher. Instantly, I think this is the difference between successful people and unsuccessful people uh, in life in general. Successful people have lower discount rates than unsuccessful people, right? They, their time value of money is lower. They're thinking longer term. Um, here's one more. Oh, we did this one already. I did it out of order, the XYZ fund. All right, let's run through some common errors. A couple of these I already talked about, but let's hit some others. Herding. People tend to do what their friends and neighbors and the news media and everything are talking about. Why? Because you feel less stupid if it's wrong, right? If you do something that's sort of all on your own and that's wrong and it goes wrong, you don't feel very good about it. But misery loves company, right? You've heard that expression. And that's true. Um, John Maynard Keynes in the general theory back in the 30s, he has a section, and when I teach investments, I always make students read this section. Uh, but part of it goes something like, um, it's better for a man to fail conventionally than to succeed unconventionally. <laughs> right? Because if you're a money manager and you fail along with all the other money managers, then well, that's okay. But if you succeed and it's weird, you still can't get hired. <laughs> right? Um, that was Keynes' point. So hurting. So we do tend to sort of follow the crowd. And some of you may have heard that book, The Wisdom of Crowds. Um, anybody read the book, The Wisdom of Crowds? It was a book that talks about, uh, and the example that they sort of tee off with is there's a, a county in England somewhere, and they've got a cow, and they're asking everybody to sort of guess the cow's weight, and the winner gets the cow or something or other. And a bunch of people fill out slips, and they put it in there. And the average answer came within like two pounds of the actual weight of the cow because the wisdom of crowds, the people who are high were balanced by the people who are low. And so there's a lot of people who say, well, the wisdom of crowds, so the, so the stock market tends to be right. And I do think the market on average tends to be efficient and things tend to be correct, correctly priced. However, to have the wisdom of crowds work, you need a number of criteria to be true. You need people's um, opinions to be uninfluenced by other people's opinions. Like when people wrote the numbers on the slip, they didn't see all the other slips, right? And that's the big one. And you need a way to aggregate this stuff. And there's some other things not really important, but that's the big one. The stock market doesn't work that way. Everybody's talking to each other. Everybody's listening to the same news media. Everybody's getting common information and swayed by common factors. So you can get periods of panic or euphoria. It goes both ways, right? In real estate or in stocks or, or whatever. So hurting is a common error. Um, so I try to pay attention for myself as chief investment officer, not only when I'm doing something that everybody else is doing, but also if I'm doing something that nobody else is doing, because I do think that the crowd tends to be right in normal periods. So if I have sort of an idiosyncratic view, I examine that very, very closely. I'll give you my current one. Here's the thing where I'm way off from everybody else. And I think everybody else is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> which again, I tend to think, you know, I'm not that smart and you know, there's all these psychological factors and I have biases and everything. So I, I examine it really closely. My fixed income positions in portfolios. How, how many of you manage money for clients? Most, most everybody has managed some money. The, um, the fixed income position in my portfolios is half tips, right? Most people have little to no tips, treasury inflation protected securities. Why? I am neutral with respect to unexpected inflation. If we have inflation higher than expected, the tips win and the regular bonds lose. And I tie because I'm 50-50. And if inflation comes in lower than expected, the tips lose and the regular bonds win. And I tie because I'm 50-50. Everybody else, for whatever reason, is massively short unexpected inflation and I don't know why. The 30-year break-even inflation rate on tips versus regular treasuries is under 2%. So in other words, we have a bet. You can take the over or under on 2% average annual inflation for the next 30 years, and everybody's overwhelmingly taking the under. <laughs> that seems weird to me, right? All right, another one. Mental accounting. People have buckets that they put things in, um, and they treat. And some, some people don't do this. Some people do. I don't tend to do this. My business partner, my daughter, my wife, they all do this. And, and so I call them. I call my business partner bucket girl, right? Because she would, would get like a, a client will sign up for a plan and we on average charge $5,000 to do a plan. Um, so we got $5,000 and she's like, oh, well now we can 
you know, replace the carpet in the office or something, whatever. We're not out of money. <laughs> Those two things are not logically connected to one another, <laughs> right? It's not like we don't have $5,000 to replace the carpet, but she always ties everything together. We got this so we can put it over here and she compartmentalizes. My daughter opens different accounts to put different things in. She's, in, she's 20, she's in college. Um, and so this summer she nannied for a family, made really good money doing that, very nice family. And then she, on the side, she taught swim lessons and did some other things. And so the, the nanny money goes in the savings account and all the other money goes in her checking account for being able to spend, but she saves that money. So she compartmentalized it. When she was littler, she had envelopes for different things. Like she'd put money away for stuff. And I don't think that way. I just have one big slush fund and it's all fine. Um, but people do mental accounting. And so where this comes up is, it's sometimes called the house money effect or the found money effect. And so if you ask people something like, um, you're balancing your checkbook, which I know people don't do that anymore, but back when people balanced their checkbooks, um, now it's just online, right? Um, you're balancing your checkbook, you find out you made a math error and you have $1,000 more than you thought you had. Uh, what, uh, what do you do with it? And you, you give people a range of choice, a multiple choice thing, and you give them a choice, you know, and there's frivolous things where you can go, you know, have a fun weekend or go, go to Vegas or whatever. And then there's reason like, I, I'll put it in my retirement plan or I'll, you know, pay extra on the mortgage or whatever like that. Um, pay off some credit card debt. I think it's one of the choices usually on there. And then another group of people that's, again, we randomly selected like we did, like I talked about earlier. Second group of people, you ask them a similar question with the same choices, but the question's slightly different. Um, you found $1,000 that you weren't expecting. Um, you want a sweepstakes or something. What do you do with it? Give them the same choices. And what turns out is the people who misbalanced their checkbook tend to do responsible things with the money because that's their money. They earned it. They worked hard for it. So they'll, they'll reduce credit card debt or put it in retirement plan or something like that. The people who like want a sweepstakes for a thousand dollars, they're going to Vegas. <laughs> and that's irrational. In both cases, somebody merely has a thousand dollars more than they thought they had a few minutes ago. Why would they make different decisions on that? Because our brains, we do mental accounting. We compartmentalize, you know, the source of the money influences where, what we do with it. And so you see this in bull markets where people will let it ride because it's, they're playing with house money, right? It's not really their money. They're up so much. So they become risk seeking um, as markets go up or real estate goes up. We saw that a few years ago, right? Loss aversion. We've talked about this a little bit already. People are not really risk averse. They're more loss averse. And I think more than loss averse, they're regret averse. Um, the ratio is about two to one. So people feel a loss about twice as strongly emotionally as a similar size gain, right? So losing $1,000 feels twice as bad as winning $1,000. And so people do irrational things because of that. One of my personal pet peeves is people, I think, are, are emotionally manipulated into buying the extended warranties on things. You ever notice how hard they try to get you to buy those? You know why they try to get you so hard to buy those? Because the profit margins are huge because they're almost useless, right? <clears throat> Anything somebody really, really wants me to do, I reflexively don't want to do, <clears throat> right? Because there's a reason. There's an incentive. And those are really profitable. But people do it because they'll, they're loss averse. What if, like, so I, I, this is the new iPhone 10s and, and you know they do the 10 is the x i think it'd be much more appropriate to call this the excess <laughs> clearly the iphone excess and i did not get the warranty on it <clears throat> and i was like sure you don't want to get the warranty no on average i'm not going to break a phone and if i break a phone i can afford to buy another one right so if i consistently across my entire life never buy the extended warranties every now and again i'll lose but on average i will make the profit margin of the warranty sellers right? But people don't think about it that way, right? If you have a lot of bets in your life, you can distribute your risk by sort of doing the right thing on all of them. But people tend to focus, I think we have one on narrow framing coming up. Um, people tend to narrowly focus on this one thing. What if something happens to this? And you should expand your set to all the things across my entire life. And here and again, I'll lose, but on average, I'm going to win. Go ahead. How do I apply that to life insurance? So on, 
on insurance in general, I explain to clients, on average, you lose money buying insurance because the insurance company does not have a printing press in their basement, right? There's no free money. You're going to lose, on average, the profit margin, the overhead, or whatever. But there are risks that you cannot afford to take. And so what we're trying to do, this is not what I usually get into here, but I'll do it here. We're not trying to maximize client portfolio size. We're trying to maximize happiness in the long run. Now, those two things are related. <laughs> People are usually happier with larger portfolios, but they're not identical. And so um, one of the things that, that I have a background in is Monte Carlo simulations. I don't know if some of you are probably familiar with that. Most of you probably not. It's a math technique for modeling uncertainty, where instead of assuming there's one future, there's many possible futures. And so when we're doing financial plans, we run 5,000 lifetimes and so forth, and there's all these futures. And what I'm trying to do is, across all the possible futures, maximize the sum of happiness. In cases where Joe Breadwinner died prematurely, the family is very unhappy, not, not only emotionally, but financially. That, that blow to the family finances is huge. Uh, so nice. giving up the upside, <laughs> all the cases where Joe Breadwinner did not die, paying a little bit of premium to hedge the case where he does die improves average happiness. Because the, the, the lowering of happiness in the good cases is not very much, but the, the increase in happiness in the bad cases is enormous. Right? So that's how I sort of view insurance. So my, my default is to not do insurance if you can afford to self-insure it, you know, or it's something minor, but if it's something, but so interestingly, I'm more anti-insurance in a lot of cases than most insurance agents. But when I do recommend insurance, the numbers I recommend are usually a lot bigger. Um, so for example, when, when insurance agents do um, death benefits, how much insurance should you buy sort of question. I think most agents, and you guys, this is the room to correct me if I have this wrong. I'm under the impression that most agents are sort of five to 10 times annual income, sort of rule of thumb. Is that accurate or? A little higher. Um, I'm at roughly 25 times because the 4% sustainable withdrawal rate you've heard about from client portfolios, that works for insurance too, right? For, the reciprocal of 4% is 25, right? So we tend to recommend a lot more insurance. Now we do tend to recommend you know, term and steps down and so forth. There are cases for having permanent insurance, but there's not as widespread, um, I think, as, as are frequently sold. But I should leave that alone here. Um, the status quo bias. People um, favor the status quo. We talked about that earlier where, um, here's another good example. <clears throat> I worked years ago uh, for a brokerage firm where I was in the home office. And through a series of corporate restructurings, I was my own department. And I reported technically to somebody who in reality was many levels above me in the org chart. I saw him like once a month in the hall. He'd go, how's it going? I go, it's going good. Like, Keep up the good work. And that was it. That was my performance review. <laughs> right? And so I was left to my own devices. And I loved that job. And I would just invite myself to meetings I thought were interesting. I visited the, the branches in California and Hilton had a brunch and um, you know, stuff like that. Um, and I would also sort of just meddle. I would just go, well, that's an interesting question. And, and some of you, um, this gentleman over here was in my CFP review class years ago and he's on my email list. I don't know if any of you, the rest of you are on. I have an, an email list for financial professionals. Um, and so those on my list know that I'm really prone to, wow, that's weird. I should just look into that. And then I spend way too much time figuring something out or building a spreadsheet or whatever. And so I would get interested in, in various questions and then I would just investigate. And so one of the ones I was interested in one time is that firm, it's, um, it was like a thousand brokers, like 500 sales assistants and 500 home office people. Uh, and most of the home office people are failed brokers, right? Because <laughs> that's how that sort of works. So everybody is either has a lot of financial knowledge or is sort of sitting outside the door of somebody with a lot of financial knowledge. And so I was curious, we had really good 401k. So what's the, um, what's the asset allocation? It was, it was American funds, A shares at NAV, right? And so I, I asked for a report. I said, I want us to know what the breakdown is. I don't want to know anybody's balance. I want to know in aggregate for the firm, how much do they have in the different holdings? What do you think by far the biggest holding was in the 401k? Cash, Cash the money market fund. I had 25% in money market because that was the default, <laughs> right? And so I was thinking, wow, if we do it wrong here, everybody does this wrong everywhere. 
Because if you ever had a shot of get, whoops, I'm getting this right. All right. Let me move on a little bit. Um, regret aversion, we talked about that already. Tyranny of choice, the more choices you have, um, the harder it is to make a decision. Um, my brother is a missionary and he goes over to the Philippines and he's lived there for the last 10 years or so. He's just back in the States uh, just a couple months ago, got back. Um, and one of the things he said is, it's really weird. He, he, first time he got back on a, on a furlough, uh, it wasn't even a furlough, it was a short trip. He went into Walmart to get something and, and he turned around and walked out. He couldn't, he couldn't deal with the Walmart. And I thought that was really weird. I mean, he grew up here like I did and everything, but he'd been in the Philippines for, I don't know, five or six years at the time. And um, he was so used to going to the store and there's like nothing there and like, okay, well, I'll take that one. You, you just buy whatever's available. And he goes into Walmart and there's like 50 options on whatever he wanted. And I'm like, I don't even know how to make a decision. You know, it's, it's too, there's too much stuff. So 401k plans, um, the Delta plan in Atlanta has over a hundred funds that you can choose from. And if you don't like any of those, it's a self-directed option to go out to the brokerage window, <laughs> right? And people don't, I mean, there's lock up into inaction. What do you do? So that's a, a common error. People um, will, are frozen out of making a, a choice. People also anchor off of irrelevant data. Uh, years ago, right after the, the, uh, the tech crash, um, people were saying, oh, I lost $100,000 in my portfolio or whatever. Um, I said, well, why don't you sell out of those tech stops and diversify your portfolio? Well, I don't want to do that. I'd have a big capital gain. Well, wait a minute. What do you mean you lost? If you lost 100,000, you're sitting on a capital gain. That means you're measuring from the high. <laughs> you're anchoring off, and people do that all the time. They anchor off of the high point. Um, availability bias. Things that you can readily recall, you will weight more heavily in your thought processes. So if you live through something personally, so for example, again, I'm not trying to pick on anybody, but if you in your immediate family or a close relative or something had um, somebody die prematurely, right? Your assessment of the need for life insurance is way higher than somebody where that didn't happen. Or if you had a family member who had an extended stay in long-term care, right? Your proclivity to sort of push the long-term care is way higher than somebody who didn't have that happen. Um, because the, the pain and everything of that is so available to you, that experience, and it happens in markets too, right? So housing is going to be um, an investment people are not all excited about for a while, right? After the Great Depression, nobody wanted to touch stocks until the next generation grew up. Um, the 70s scarred a bunch of people on inflation, right? But then the, you get the new people who don't know, right? And then they're fine again. Um, let me mention one other thing about availability bias. If you spent a bunch of effort to get the information, this is a financial analyst sort of bias, that more effort you spent getting the information the more you'll overweight the information in your decision. So if I spend a couple hours trying to figure something out, even though the thing I figured out might be of trivial importance, I'll tend to give it far too much weight. Mm -hmm. Hindsight bias, of course, we're all terrible about this. Um, we look back and things seem predictable. I can't tell you how many times I have seen somebody in the news, some, usually a portfolio manager or something saying, well, now is a particularly uncertain time in the markets, right? with Trump and you know, all the stuff that we don't, nobody knows right now is particularly unsettled. It's always particularly unsettled all the time. I promise. It's just when you look back, you know how it came out. So it seems more predictable, right? You don't remember the level of uncertainty. I, I had a, a guy who was in one of my classes years ago and, and we're still good friends. If anything happens to him, he likes to manage his own money, but if anything happens to him, his wife's supposed to move everything to us. So we have lunch every couple of years. Um, and we were talking about this, and he's a really smart guy. He's a retired general surgeon. And um, he said, well, you know, in the last week, I have thought the market was going up three times and down two times, and we're having a recession or not having a recession. So whatever happens, I'll remember knowing that. <laughs> and I think that's probably a lot of wisdom in that. We, we do. So, so we always think that things were more predictable in the past than they are now. Sample size. People use sample sizes that are way too small. How am I doing on time? Okay. All right. Um, let me give you a really good example. And we got some people who do portfolios in the room. So, so don't be shy. I need audience participation for this. Imagine that you have a manager that beats their appropriately specified benchmark, right? They're 90% correlated to this benchmark. So because the easiest way to get an alpha is to misspecify your benchmark, right? 90% correlated benchmark and they have an alpha, an outperformance 
on average of 2% over the benchmark. For those of you who do not manage money, that is huge. People would kill their grandmothers for a 2% alpha. Okay? But obviously, if it's a one-year track record, you go, oh, that could be a fluke. Two years, you'd feel a little bit better about it, and so forth. How many years of data would you need to know with 95% confidence, right? So for statistical significance, 95% confidence that it's not worse. In other words, I don't need a 2% alpha to, be, to buy this fund. Historically, it's been 2%. How many years of 2% outperformance do I need to know with 95% confidence that it's not worse than the index fund is compared to or whatever the index is compared to, right? And 20% standard deviation, 90% correlation, it's all for the number of years. Audience participation, how many, how many years do you think you need for 95% confidence? 10? Five? Anybody else? 20? Anybody else? Those are very typical answers. You guys are exactly what I normally get. Correct answer is, you drum roll, 56 years. <laughs> and everybody's looking at five or 10 year track records. That is, that is no meaningful information in a five or 10 year track record at all. I mean, if you look at the correlation to certain things over five or 10 years to sort of see how is this thing invested or what are its exposures, that's fine. But alpha, it's useless information. Sample size error, that sample size is too small. And somebody says, well, what if I do monthly data? Then I have more data. Yeah, but your, your alpha shrank too. It's 2% annually, it's less than a month. It doesn't help you. <laughs> I actually did the data monthly when I did it. It's 56 years. <laughs> Self-attribution bias, this is one of my favorite ones. Um, and this one is, is, is visual, so the people on, on your, you can stop doing email and watch this for one second. Um, <laughs> I know what's going on online. <laughs> You pick an investment and it goes up, you know, hands in pockets like, I was a genius, <laughs> right? Get that little rock going. You pick an investment and it goes down, well, that was unlucky, <laughs> right? We get credit for all the wins and no credit for any losses at all because that was outside of my control. Who could have seen that coming? <laughs> Even if the thing that worked, worked for some completely random reason that had nothing to do with the reason you bought the investment. <laughs> you still will take all the credit for that. And we're just, and I'm not picking on you, I'm the same way. We just, as humans, that's the way we're wired. And this self-attribution bias feeds back into the overconfidence because all the decisions we made that were good are because we're geniuses. So therefore, my decisions are always good. I'm a genius, <laughs> right? Confirmation bias. Um, the, the, the publication is, is discontinued now but I used to, frequently I would have one I'd be reading and it would be my bag and I would pull it out as an example. I used to get a, a publication called the Journal of Indexes because I think markets are largely efficient and I tend to usually put mostly passive strategies. Um, and that's straight up confirmation bias. I'm not carrying around the, the Journal of Active Management, <laughs> right? <laughs> and the active managers are not carrying around the Journal of Indexes. And I can say this with, with great confidence no, nobody has to show hands or anything, but those of you in the room who are politically conservative, watch Fox. <laughs> those of you in the room who are politically liberal, watch either CNN or MSNBC, right? Why? Because we don't like being confronted with things that disagree with our point of view, right? But we should, I try, I'm sure I don't do it perfectly, but I really, really try to give attention to things that disagree with me and, and not read it, just dismiss it, but read it and actually consider whether they might have a point somewhere, right? So I, I read the Wall Street Journal all week and I get the New York Times Sunday edition, <laughs> right? Those are two very different outlooks on the same things. Um, and I try to give them both appropriate weight and make sure that I'm not, not missing anything. Um, if, a, if a study comes out, I read a lot of academic research, academic research comes out, on how active management works or whatever, I try to read that with an open mind and see if there's something you know, that I have missed or something that, where they have a point. So confirmation bias, you should try to disprove the things that you think. It's hard to do, it's painful for people to do. It's painful people admit they're wrong or change their opinion. Um, politicians, especially today, cannot ever be seen to change their minds ever. Um, 
somebody was in a debate with Keynes back in the 20s, I think it was, maybe the early 30s, um, and said, well, you've changed your mind on this. You've changed your position on this. He said, well, I got new information, so I changed my mind. What do you do? <laughs> Familiarity bias. The things you are familiar with seem less risky. The people in Atlanta over own Coca-Cola, UPS, Home Depot. The people here over own what? Berkshire Hathaway, which that's not a terrible thing, but <laughs> that's worked out pretty well, uh, except for the last 10 years, right? You're behind the S&P 500, I think, over the last 10 years on that one. Um, any other local things that are really popular? I used to live in Richmond, Virginia. People owned the crap out of Circuit City. That was a terrible decision. <laughs> Union Pacific, right? So over on Union Pacific. Um, things that are familiar to you feel less risky. Why? From an evolutionary perspective, if you've seen it a bunch and you're still here, that means it did not eat you, <laughs> right? Not risky. So people over own their employer stock, right? And they think, well, but I know this. And they over own real estate in their local area. I know this area. And buy some investment real estate. Um, and for most people, their largest item on their balance sheet, on their asset list, is a single family house that they live in. So then they're going to diversify by buying another single family house next door. <laughs> That's stupid, <laughs> right? We'll talk about mortgages and stuff, second session. Overconfidence, we've already beat to death. So those are a list of some of the common errors. So I, I titled this behavioral finance uh, and decision-making. So I actually made up a decision-making checklist. I don't know if any of you read the book, the, the Checklist Manifesto. Highly recommend it. It's a story of how having, a, it's written by a doctor. A simple checklist in operating rooms in the hospital actually improved outcomes by a lot because people just don't do the simple things because they overlook it or they skip it this time or whatever. And there's a reason why pilots use checklists. Um, so I made decision-making checklist. And let's see, and I have about what, Seven, eight minutes to go on this? Okay. Um, first of all, clearly define the question of the problem, not the symptom, right? There's a tendency for us to get bogged down in symptoms, but what's the actual problem? Joe Blow doesn't have enough money to live on is not the problem. That's a symptom of Joe Blow spends too much money, <laughs> right? Or Joe Blow doesn't make enough money or some combination of those two things or something else. Create a, create a pro con list. So this is sometimes called the Ben Franklin, where he took a piece of paper, put a line down the middle, write down the pros, write down the cons. And then he said, you know, things that are roughly equal weight, like this thing is sort of equal to these two, cross those off, right? So then you're, whichever column has a thing left in it, that's the one you should do. That's a good way to sort of crystallize your thinking. Um, create a pro con list. Now this gets a little mathy, but I'll, I'll try to explain. Determine the distribution of the outcome. So if I'm contemplating buying a piece of real estate or something, I want to think about the distribution of outcomes. What's my best case scenario? What's my worst case scenario? What's my expected outcome? And then in statistical terms, what's the sigma? What's the standard deviation? How volatile is the range of outcomes? Um, skewness has to do with, uh, you're familiar with bell curve. If, if it's not a normally distributed curve, one side could be out further than the other. For example, um, net worth of families in Omaha, I dare say is positively skewed. It's skewed most places positively. It's really skewed positively here because Warren, <laughs> right? If Warren worked, walked in the room, on average, we're all really rich. <laughs> I sometimes use Bill Gates other places, but it seems like I should use Warren here, right? On average, we're all really rich because there's extreme, there's a bell curve, like the tail goes like over here somewhere, right? Um, so if you have a right skew or a left skew, it's important to know hedge funds tend to have left skews. You're far more likely to lose 100% than to make 100%, right? Important to know that. And then kurtosis, which you've heard of, you've heard of this concept, but this is the math term for it. Uh, you heard this called black swans or fat tails. Right, you have outlying distributions, and this is different from standard deviation. Standard deviation is like stocks are more spread out than bonds, but they still could both be normal. Compared to normal, are the tails heavier? It's so it's more peaked in the middle, and then fatter on the outside is 
is kurtosis. So you have more outliers than you would expect. That can be important. And sometimes you don't really know this data, but I try to at least think about it and have, maybe it's a subject, maybe it's not a, a number, but subjectively, do I think that any of these things might be true? And things like kurtosis plus negative skewness, right? So I have, I have bad cases happen because it's not just normal distribution and there's heavier weights in the tails. Those two things in combination are bad. You get that with high yield bonds, for example, right? Not a lot, but a little bit. And it's a little bit with REITs too. You have a little bit of a fat tail, a little bit of negative skewness. Check for biases. This is one I use for me personally. I make no changes to client asset allocations if I can detect any emotion in myself whatsoever. I'll rebalance. If somebody adds money or needs money, I'll rebalance and you know, invest the funds. But I don't make any changes to the models. If I can detect any euphoria, excitement, fear, worry, panic, any of those things, no changes. It's only when I'm completely dispassionate. And I will make changes, it's rare, but I will make changes. But it's only when, like, this, this just looks wrong or this seems like a better decision, but I don't have any emotion around it. Um, I saw a lot of advisors, people that I thought were good advisors on average, but after the 2008 meltdown, were, like, going to cash and everything after the stuff went down because they're just so scared and so emotional about it. Um, this is probably why I don't talk to clients very much. My partner, Anita, is mostly the client contact because um, I tend to not be as empathetic probably. Right. Yeah, the market went down by half. That's normal. That's what I would expect it to do. <laughs> Let's go do that a couple times. If you stay a client long enough, we'll do that a couple times. Um, I actually have that. Every new client that comes on board, I have this conversation. What's your name? Tom. Tom. Hey, Tom, I'm glad you're going to join us. Let me just set expectations. You've got a million-dollar portfolio. We've determined that the appropriate asset allocation for you is 60-40, 60% stocks, 40% bonds. Um, so I want you to understand what that means, Tom. That means a year from now, you can open up your statement or look online. Instead of being a million dollars, it could be $700,000. Because in a normal bear market, I expect the risky stuff to go down by half. That's my rule of thumb. So you don't have to answer this, but I would say, Tom, how does that make you feel? If you, oh, if, once you really picture this, you pull up online, and it's 700000 How do you feel about that? And then in the real world, I shut up and let him talk. Because the worst case scenario for me is client rides it down and then exits. <laughs> I need the full cycle. And I love that rule of thumb, by the way. Feel free to steal that, right? In a normal bear market, risky stuff goes down by half. That happened in 73, 74. It happened in 2000, 2002. And I started using this with clients in 2005. And then it happened in 2000, end of 07 to early 09. It was also down about half. It's a really, really good, you don't have to do fancy math and Monte Carlos and everything you use. Risky stuff goes down by half. What's risky stuff? Everything that is not investment grade bonds or cash. <laughs> Remember how they say correlations go to one in a bear market? The only thing that goes up is correlations. You've heard that line. That's not true. Investment grade bonds get more negatively correlated. All the risky stuff goes to one, the correlations, but not the not, the not risky stuff. Are you anchoring on irrelevant data that's available or overweighting difficult data? We touched on that earlier. Is there status quo bias, confirmation bias, narrow framing? I've talked about all those things. Is everyone doing it? Right? Do I feel better about this because everybody's doing it? Or has the paradigm shifted? Are things different? Um, until the late 1950s, everybody knew, knew, for very sound reasons, that dividend yields had to be higher than interest rates. Stocks are riskier than bonds. Why would you take less money? The return has to be higher, and the return, and the, there was no expectation that capital gains, on average, would be gains. Capital would fluctuate, but there was sort of a zero expectation of the up versus down, and the dividend was the whole deal until the late 50s. Are you overconfident? We talked about, have you considered sunk costs? The stuff that's already invested is irrelevant. And people, politicians are terrible about that. We already spent a billion dollars on this. We can't stop now. <laughs> Maybe you should stop now. <laughs> the money you already spent is not relevant, right? Do you have to make a decision or can you, is not making a decision a decision? Is there a correlation with another risk exposure? Buying the house next door correlates with a risk exposure you already have. Have you identified all the alternatives? Have you conducted a pre-mortem? I'm running short on time, but let me, this one is important. Pre-mortem is assume the thing failed. Whatever you're about to do, 
you're going to merge with another advisor, or you're going to buy something, you're going to do whatever. Assume it's five years from now when it was the biggest failure ever. Write a story about why. All the people involved, if it's your office, right? We're going to merge with another firm, we're going to change custodians or whatever. Everybody write a little vignette on why this blew up. You will surface things that nobody thought of and things that people were scared to say in the meetings. Do you have data? If there's data, do you data mine? Have you tested it out of sample? Are there theoretical pending, underpinning independent of the data? In other words, I would like to know why something should work and I would like some data that it has actually worked. I'd like both. And what if I'm wrong? Can I mitigate the poor outcomes? Can I hedge the bet somehow? And then the most important was, does this decision maximize happiness? Because at the end of the day, that's really what it's about. Does it maximize happiness? Or minimize regret? I mean, those are two sides of the same coin sometimes. Okay? So I think I probably don't have time for questions. We'll take questions <laughs> at the end of the next session. Uh, I am 100% certain it is time for a 10-minute break. Not 12, 10 minutes. Um, so, David, thank you very much. Before we cut to our break, we're going to go back to Zach at Falls Church for another polling question. Dual viewers. So, this polling question is From which state are you viewing this program? I'll repeat that. What state are you viewing this program from? Please use the polling function on your screen to respond. You have two minutes. Now, as Brad said, we are going on a 10 minute break. So as a reminder, we will be having a Q&A at the end of the presentation. So feel free to send us your questions via chat or Q&A in Zoom. And we will be right back. All right. Welcome back, everybody. As a reminder, there will be questions and answers at the end of this program. For those that are watching virtually, um, you can chat your questions in. They will get those questions to us. So without further ado, David, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, very good. I enjoyed this morning. The camera person says it's good if I stand over here. It's got a nice backdrop and everything. So I'm going to try to remember to do that and not walk around so much. But um, the second um, half of this, I just have two sort of topics that are interesting that I can go on and on and on about. So I will not do that because I do want to leave time for questions because sometimes that's the stuff that comes up in questions is the most interesting stuff. So the first topic is paying down a mortgage. Um, and you get this question from a client, what should I do? Should I pay off my mortgage or should I pay it down? Should I make extra payments on it or should I put that in the market or what should I do? And what got me thinking about this many years ago and this, I wrote up a little blurb about it and I, somebody put this question on one of the old financial planning message boards, you know, back in the day. And um, I thought the analysis was terrible. And so I did a little analysis and then somebody reading the message board was an editor at financial planning magazine and said, can you make this an article? And I said, sure. And I did that. And then I, I wrote a little white paper on it and, and I've expanded it over time. The first thing that makes me absolutely crazy. And so if you've actually done this, we'll let you remain completely anonymous. You should pretend you have never done this. Um, but an advisor one time I heard him actually Tell, he was telling another advisor about what he told a client. He said, I told him it's stupid to pay off your mortgage. The mortgage is only 6% and we're going to get 10 in the market. And this is years ago. <laughs> but the mortgage is risk-free. <laughs> the market is risky. The appropriate comparison for a mortgage is treasuries. And you say, well, mortgage is not risk-free. No, it's not risk-free to the bank. It's risk-free to you. It's safer than treasuries. There's always the danger that Trump could have a bad hair day or something and decide not to pay the debt or some crazy thing could happen with politics, right? There is no case where if you pay off your mortgage, you have to make a mortgage payment, <laughs> right? The return on paying off your mortgage or the payments you don't have to make, there is no way that can be defaulted on, right? So you compare the treasury rates. To, now I'm going to give arguments on both sides. So this is the first one. Is just make sure you realize the benchmark is treasuries with the same duration as the mortgage. And I actually, because I'm a nerd, I have a duration calculator on my website where you can actually put in mortgages and stocks and bonds and things, and it will calculate the effective duration. So normally, a 30-year mortgage that was just taken out is about the same duration as a 10-year treasury, ballpark. So if you want to sort of benchmark, you could just use a 10-year treasury rate. We'll get to some other stuff in a minute. But that's the first thing. 
The second thing is it's part of the asset allocation. Suppose frequently when I speak, I have a flip chart or whiteboard or something, so I'll try to do this without that. Suppose somebody has a million dollar portfolio, 60, 40, 60% stocks, 40% bonds. And they have a $400,000 mortgage. That person is owed 400,000 bonds and they owe 400,000 mortgage. So their effective asset allocation is 100% stocks. But most people don't think about it that way, but they really are. And worse, they're, they have a net zero bond position, but they're paying on the spread. <laughs> their mortgage rate is higher than the bond interest rate. So they're long, short, fixed income and paying on the spread, negative carry. Right? So think of it as part of the asset allocation. Now, here's the interesting nuances to this. First, taxes. So prior to the last tax act, I could make the simplifying assumption that virtually everybody who's a client of ours in, in this room who has a mortgage, they probably itemize and they're already over well over the standard deduction with their taxes and everything else. So we could just assume you get a full deduction on the mortgage, and if you had fixed income in a taxable account, you would pay tax on that, so it's a tie. In other words, your mortgage rate is lower by your tax bracket, and the earnings, the interest on the bonds is also lower by your tax bracket, so you can sort, ignore after-tax returns and just do it gross, and, and you're fine. The only little wrinkle to that that I would bring up just for the sake of thoroughness is if you really are comparing to treasuries and you're in a state that has state taxes, there's no state taxes on treasuries. So if you want to adjust by the amount of the state tax bracket, you could if you wanted to be hyper precise, right? But now it's complicated. Now, many people are not itemizing or if they are itemizing, it's not by that much. Suppose somebody has the $10,000 state and local tax exemption, but they don't give any charitable contributions or anything else, and they're married filing joint, the first $14,000 of interest is not deductible. It's only the piece above that that's deductible. So that made the after-tax equivalent cost of your mortgage even higher. This strengthened the case for pay off or pay down the mortgage. Again, I'm gonna give some arguments the other way in a second, but it, this item, strengthens the case for paying off the mortgage or paying it down. And, and they're mathematically equivalent. Making extra mortgage payments or paying the whole thing off, the math is the same. It's just magnitude is different. Psychology. This can go two different ways and it roughly breaks. So this is where I get in trouble because somebody will quote me out of context. This roughly breaks on gender lines. I know it's a politically correct world now. I'm not saying this is 100% true of men or women at all. I just think it sort of on average goes a little bit one way or the other, right? Um, women on average, right? And not all women are like this and some men are like this, but women on average, the mortgage is paid off. I feel so much better about that. I don't care about the market because the mortgage is paid off, right? The increased security from house paid off wins. Now, remember I said, you a million dollar portfolio, 60, 40, and a $400,000 mortgage. So that means that if somebody's gonna pay off the mortgage, I would tell them you should take the $400,000 in bonds and you should pay off the mortgage with that. That means the remaining piece is now $600,000 all stocks. That feels wrong. It's not wrong. If it's wrong, the original asset allocation was wrong. So I didn't change the asset allocation. All I did was net the two bond positions, right? But that's gonna feel really risky. But again, a lot of people will process that as, but the house is paid off, I don't care what the market does. I'm okay with that. Other people, predominantly men, I'm gonna hit my, hit my mic. Portfolio used to be a million dollars. Now it's only 600,000. I feel a little emasculated. <laughs> <laughs> right? Not really happy with the portfolio looking smaller. They, they feel like, I don't know. It's a reflection of their virility or something, I don't know. But I think men on average sort of, they would rather have the larger portfolio even if they have a mortgage over here, right? So the psychology of that is important. Remember, we're trying to maximize happiness. Yes, sir. Go ahead, no, go ahead. Well, is the lack of liquidity that you have- I'm gonna to get to that. I have more nuances and that is one of them, yeah. Inflation hedge. If somebody has large inflation exposures, 
a 30 year fixed rate mortgage is a great hedge on that. Right. So let me give you an example. Do you guys have, is there a local employer that has really, really large pensions for, for um, employees? Anybody? Uh, in Atlanta, it used to be Delta back in the day, but not anymore. I see somebody saying not anymore. Um, suppose somebody had a, a $6,000 a month pension for the rest of their life, but is no COLA. And suppose that's a really significant part of their, if you, if you the present value of that, significant part of their net worth. One of the ways to remove the risk on that is suppose they took out a really large 30 year fixed rate mortgage and the mortgage payment was $3,000 a month. What you effectively did was you monetized half the pension. In other words, instead of paying cash for the house, you still have the cash and you have a mortgage payment that is half the size of your pension payment. So it's like you cashed out half, your mortgage, half of your pension. Does that make sense? It's like you went to J.G. Wentworth and Associates and sold half of your income stream, but you got it at mortgage rates, not the extortionate J.G. Wentworth rate. You guys have those commercials here, right? The J.G. Wentworth, it's my money, I want it now, you know what I'm talking about? Okay. This is a great deal. If you're trying to hedge an inflation exposure and somebody with a long-term, very large pension with no COLA, they have some inflation exposure. So having a fixed rate mortgage long-term can be good for that. <clears throat> um, there is a clergy catch. <clears throat> if you have a client who is a minister and they get the housing allowance, the housing allowance is, is limited to the lesser of three things, the amount they spend on housing expenses, the fair market rental value of the house, and the amount that's designated as housing allowance in their pay. If you pay off the mortgage, you will screw up the actual expenses part of it. And the clergy gets to double dip this. They not only don't report for income taxes, the housing allowance piece, they also get the deduction for the mortgage interest if they're itemizing. So it's a, it's a very nice double dip. So don't like reflexively pay off the mortgage for a minister without sort of figuring out, does this make any sense? Like if they don't itemize, that's fine. But if they itemize, um, it could be a problem. Um, now here's a big one, taxable funds only. So the example I gave, million dollars, 60% stocks, 40% bonds, I didn't say anything about whether it's an IRA or a taxable account, I sort of assumed it was all taxable. I would not take money, I would, I would not tell somebody, don't max out your 401k, pay extra on your mortgage, right? I would always do the tax advantage stuff first. I would not liquidate a 401k or an IRA to pay off a mortgage. Um, in 2008, um, we thought we'd done a pretty good job with our clients um, and we had nobody leave and nobody changed asset allocations and everybody was on board, which I considered a, a success. And then at one point, I got a voicemail from a longstanding client who said, uh, I was wondering if I should liquidate my 401k and pay off the mortgage. So I got to the office and I talked to my partner, Anita. I said, well, this is the first sign of panic we've had. Maybe people are more worried than I thought they were. I thought we had everybody sort of uh, doing okay. I said, let me call her and then maybe we need to split up the client list and just call and touch base with everybody, you know, do a feel good thing. So I called the lady and then I got off the phone. I went to Anita's office. I said, we don't need to call everybody. This was just them. She said, well, why? What's going on? I said, they, at dinner last night, she said to her husband, can I stop working yet? And he said, no, not till the mortgage is paid off. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, yeah. <laughs> so she worked until the mortgage was paid off under normal terms and then uh, retired. They're retired now. Um, but anyway, so if it's taxable funds, that's when you're really comparing apples to apples with fixed income to fixed income. But a lot of people would have most of their money is in um, retirement plans and so forth. And then, actually, I don't, I, I said I was going to get to it later. It is not on here. There is a, a liquidity issue, right? Obviously, if you think you might need the money, that's irrevocable if you've paid off the mortgage. So there is a huge piece of that. Uh, we always have clients get, first of all, let me back this up. We only take clients that don't have behavioral problems. <laughs> <laughs> nice work if you can get it, mostly. In other words, if a client has a persistent spending problem, if somebody needs technical expertise or education, we can do that. If they want to delegate it, so we just want somebody else to take care of it, they don't want to deal with it, we can do that. If somebody has financial issues, like psycho psychological issues, I can't fix that. And I don't know if anybody can, but I'm convinced I can't. If somebody spends more than they make, I can't solve that problem. And again, maybe somebody out there is good at that, but they, they should go to that other person. So we, we'll fire clients who are on a path to non-success. <laughs> um, 
we have uh, three clients we're letting go this year uh, that are smaller that we thought that would be successful over time, but they're spending the portfolios down instead of saving. So we're gonna let them go. We'll transition them very nicely out to probably Vanguard. Um, but liquidity is a big deal. But here's the big one. So when I was thinking through this, um, there's a buddy of mine who's five years older than me, very, very smart guy, much smarter than I am. Um, he's a CFA. His last job, he managed uh, $65 billion, um, chief investment officer for a large firm. And we were kicking this around and we've gone, okay, it's a short bond position and we're sort of doing the math. You know, this is interesting. I don't know if people really think about it this way. And so we agreed. And so he knows my financial situation in broad strokes and I know his in broad strokes. And I said, so are you going to uh, pay off your mortgage? Because I know he has fixed income in his taxable account and so forth. And I knew he still had a mortgage and he had way more than enough money to pay it off. I said, you can pay your mortgage off. He said, no, this doesn't work for me. And that's what he does to me. He says things like that and he lets it hang and makes me ask. Okay, I give up. Why, why does this not work for you? And then he made a really good point because he's annoying that way too. He makes really good points that you didn't think of. He said, if I pay off the mortgage, all that happens is household spending goes up $2,000 a month. Oh, yeah. For a lot of people, this is a forced savings mechanism and that may be the fatal flaw. The, the flaw may not be mathematical, it may be behavioral. If you take money out of your portfolio and pay your mortgage off, you have to make the mortgage payment to your portfolio. And I think a lot of people would not do that. So that may be the, the fatal flaw to this whole thing. Um, we do very often recommend people pay off their mortgages, um, but if people who have fixed income is overflowed into their taxable account usually um, and get rid of them that way. But, um, Anyway, any questions, comments on the mortgage issue? Does that all make sense? What do you think about the mortgage? What do I think about, who said that? I heard the voice, but I didn't, they, okay. I heard it from back there, I couldn't tell why. Reverse mortgages is the question. I got quoted years ago, I think in investment news it was. Um, I said, reverse mortgages are a very, very, very good last option. <laughs> um, which I stand by that, that opinion. Um, we don't explicitly put them in the plans, the financial plans that we do for clients, but we do uh, implicitly have at the back of our minds, like if you do Monte Carlo and you get sort of 95% success, well, in the 5%, we could still do a reverse mortgage, right? It's sort, of the, it's sort of the emergency backup plan. So I don't like, I don't ever plan on the reverse mortgage because I like to keep some powder dry for what if something goes really crazy. Um, we always have that to fall back on. So that's my opinion. They're, they're expensive, um, you know, the, the uh, transaction costs are, are pretty high on those. Um, I was going, to, years ago, they changed them a couple of years ago, changed the form of how much you could get out. Prior to that, I was gonna do some math, but I couldn't get the data. Um, I thought there was an arbitrage opportunity, actually, um, because if you took out a reverse mortgage, you were, you were buying a call option on your house. It was more complicated than that, but essentially you retained a call option on the house. No, you'd sold a put, that's what it was. Because if the house is worth less than the met value of the thing, you just put it to the bank and they own the problem. But if it goes up, your heirs can buy it. Um, and I thought it was mispriced because there was no adjustment for health status or gender, right? So the perfect case would be, suppose you had two women who were married to each other, right? So when that became a thing that you could legally do, it goes to the survivor and they're using a standard mortality to price the reverse mortgage. I thought, and obviously the longer the term on an option, the more it's worth. So since you could stretch the term out, I thought it might be mispriced. The, where I got stuck on doing the math though, I need the standard deviation for a single house. <laughs> and I emailed Bob Schiller <laughs> and he didn't reply. <laughs> right? Bob Schiller is the one who wrote Irrational Exuberance. He had the whole thing about that Case Schiller housing index thing. Um, so I, I apparently did not, not get his attention. He didn't find that intriguing enough to do it. And then they changed the rule. And I was pretty sure with the new, more conservative underwriting that it wasn't going to work anymore. So then I sort of just dropped it. Anyway, good question. Anything else? Yes, sir. I wanted to ask you for people that are high equity positions in their home, and yet they may be underscaped over their lifetime on the retirement side. Uh, what's your view about you know, a lot of dollars being bottled up in that? Yeah, so let me, let me unpack a little, a subtle thing here first, which I find 
a very common belief and sometimes I have trouble debunking it, even though I'm sure that it's wrong. So let me see if I can successfully do this. I think you might be doing this a little bit, although I don't think you're married to it, so it'll be fine. But unless you plan, unless defaulting on your mortgage is a real possibility, and for a lot of people it's not. I mean, they're so far away from that ever being a thing that would ever happen, you can practically ignore the default option, right? then the mortgage has nothing to do with the house. In other words, your real estate exposure is 100% of the value of your real estate. And you also owe some money, but those are two disconnected things. So the reason I jumped on that when you said that is the amount of equity somebody has in the house is actually not relevant. You always own all the, you own the exposure to the entire value of your house. And you also owe a bank some money. The only time you combine those two, like I said, is if you, know, you have a very thin layer of equity and you think, I could just walk away from this. I could, you know, what they call it, jingle mail, mail the keys in. Um, you know, then you could consider it one thing. But for most of our clients, that's not a realistic option. They're never going to declare bankruptcy or do that. So therefore, those are two separate things. So then, so your, your point is they've got a house and they have a low mortgage, but maybe they don't have a lot of other savings. So... What you suppose they remortgaged the house, cash out refi, to get more money, or they moved to another house so they could still deduct it if that was an issue. And then they took that and they invested in a diversified portfolio, or did a reverse mortgage so they can invest in a diversified portfolio, or something like that. What you're really saying, and if, if compliance departments don't process it this way, because otherwise they would lose their minds, but what you're really saying is you should buy stocks on margin. <laughs> Right, the fixed paying the thing off, you got the fixed income exposure nailed because you paid the mortgage down. So relative to somebody with a larger mortgage, you have more fixed income, but you may not have as much in stocks. So that may be a problem. So should you essentially lever up to own stocks? And that in some cases that might be right, but I would be really, really caught. It'd be a rare case and I'd be cautious about it, but yeah. Um, and for those folks, maybe the reverse mortgage is the only way they can be retired, but now you've removed sort of all the emergency backup plans. You know, um, if they do reverse mortgage to get enough money to live on in retirement because the only thing they have, um, I'd rather have them downsize significantly. In other words, own where you are. Don't pretend you can afford this house. <laughs> this is why I'm not allowed to talk to clients. <laughs> right. Any other questions, comments? All right. The second um, topic, these, these two topics are the most popular white papers that I ever did. And they're really popular with CPAs in particular. So that you should pay the mortgage off. The second one about should you do a Roth IRA or a traditional IRA. So let me do a quick example first, and then we'll sort of unpack it a bunch. Assume somebody's in a 25% marginal income tax bracket forever. And I did this back when there was an actual bracket that was 25%, but it makes the math nice and easy. So let's leave it there. <laughs> Scenario one. You earn $1,000, you, you pay $250 in income taxes on it, and you put the remaining $750 in a Roth. Okay. Scenario two, I'm sorry, and then the investment grows, it doubles to be $1,500. If you take it out, you get to spend $1,500. So the reason I, I did an analysis on this, and sort of um, introduce this a little, I saw a couple of national uh, financial planning publications, I, this is like a dozen years ago, where they were talking about IRAs versus Roths, and they screwed up the analysis. And I had done the analysis, but I went, well, that's wrong. So then I had to actually do it. And what they messed up is they either started with contributions and forgot to account that one is pre-tax and one's after tax, or they stopped with balances and forgot to account for one is pre-tax and one is after tax. So you've got to go all the way from um, Joe Blow earns a dollar to Joe Blow spends a dollar, right? And see how it goes. So this is scenario one, the Roth scenario. You get $1,500 at the end of the day. Everybody follow that? Scenario two, earn $1,000. But this time you put it in a deductible IRA and there's no taxes because it's tax deductible. It also doubles. So, so the rate of return on these is the same, right? They both doubled over some period of time. $2,000, you take it out, still in 25% bracket, pay $500 in taxes, and you get to spend $1,500. It's a tie. Well, that's interesting. It makes no difference what you do on the assumptions I use. And some of you in your head are already throwing objections at me mentally. <laughs> but you forgot about, no, I didn't. I just didn't get there yet. Give me a second. Factors. <laughs> 
what are the future tax rates going to be? I don't know. And here you're dealing with a combination of unknowns. Not only you need the intersection of the client's financial situation and the tax code, neither of which are knowable. Okay. Um, and in some cases, that future tax bracket might not be yours. It might be your children's, right? If you're in the 25% tax bracket and your kids are in the 35, you should probably do a Roth conversion. If you're in the 25% tax bracket, your kids are in the 15, you should probably not if you're going to leave it to the kids. Um, if you have taxable savings, and I didn't do this example, but... If you're maxing everything out, the Roth wins by a little because the, the see if I can do it off here. Again, I usually have a whiteboard and I, I do it the long way. Um, <coughs> scenario one, suppose you own, you earned Um, now nah, it's going to be too complicated to do without being able to write it down. Um, if, you've maxed, if you've maxed this out, if you max out the Roth, because the same nominal limit applies to the IRA, you can put more in a Roth than you can an IRA. In other words, if I make $6,000, sorry, if I make $8,000, I can pay 25% tax and put $6,000 in a Roth. But if I put $6,000 in the deductible IRA, I have $2,000 left over that I can't fit in a retirement plan. Does that make sense? That 2,000 is the taxes that are gonna be due on the six, right, whenever I take it out. Over time, the six grows and the two grows, but the two will grow slower than the six because it's subject to tax all the time. It has dividends, has interest, has portfolio turnover, you're gonna have drag as you go. And at the end, when you liquidate the position to pay off the taxes on the IRA, it's not enough to cover all the taxes. So you have tax drag. So whether you're thinking of contributions or conversions, this is why they say if you can pay the taxes from outside the IRA on the conversion, it makes more sense. That's absolutely right. Absolutely correct. There is one way to get the taxable account to be very equivalent to a Roth. Right? People don't think about this, but there is. First of all, you buy a very, very, very tax efficient investment. Ideally, no dividends, no interest, no turnover. Can't get all the way there. My favorite one at the moment is by the Vanguard Total Stock Market ETF, VTI. It's three and a half basis points cost. <laughs> It'll never issue a capital gain for technical reasons I won't get into. But ETF providers have figured out they never have to pay capital gains out. The dividend yield is 2%. So you have a 2% annual sort of drag from the, from the dividend yield, but that's it. How can you make that very close to Roth-like? Except for that 2% dividend yield, how can you make that Roth-like? Well, die. <laughs> it's a full step up in basis. That's mathematically the same as if I owned a Roth. So you can make a taxable account very tax efficient if you hold it all the way till death and get a step up and it was a very tax efficient investment in the first place. Now, most people need money to live on, so that's not necessarily going to work, but possible. Okay. Let me get back to my scenarios, my factors. Um, if you have taxable savings, if you have charitable intent, if you want to leave a charitable bequest, the most efficient thing to do is leave a retirement plan with no basis, right? Because charities don't pay taxes. You leave them $100,000 IRA, they get the whole hundred. Anybody else who gets it gets less than a hundred net. So, in a class one time, um, I had a young lady who worked for a nonprofit, and she, I don't remember what she said. She asked me something, it was a CPA class, and she, um, she said something, and I sort of made up this, this thing. I said, well, imagine if you have an investment where you put the money away. It's sort of like a donor advised fund. You put the money away and you get a deduction and you can choose how it's invested and on your death, it goes to charity, or eventually it goes to charity. But at any point, if you decide, you know, I really wish I hadn't given that money away, you can take it back. You just 
have to pay income taxes on it. Cause you got a deduction up front. So if you change your mind and go, oh, never mind, I don't want that to go to let me give that back. You just pay the income taxes on it at that point, and then you can spend it to live on in retirement or whatever, right? That's an IRA with a charitable beneficiary. <laughs> if you think about it that way, sort of just looking at it sort of backwards, right? You've, you denoted it's gonna go to charity, but if you ever change your mind, you can just take it back, pay the taxes, right? And now with the QCDs, you can actually pay money out of it after 70 and a half as you go without waiting till death, if you wanted to. Using, giving a, an IRA to charity at death is the only way, the only way to get a income tax deduction on a charitable bequest. Charitable bequests get estate tax deductions. They don't get income tax deductions, right? But if you put money in your IRA or 401k and got a deduction, got an income tax deduction and you left it to charity, that's like getting an income tax deduction on your charitable bequest. And that's the only way to do it. If you have a taxable estate, a lot of the articles that are written, um, they actually get this, they get this right for the wrong reasons and in the wrong magnitude. So let me, let me clear it up. And, and you guys, I, I don't think this is a heavily tax oriented group. So this is gonna get a little, a little taxy, but I'll run through it anyway. The logic is if I have $100,000 in my IRA and I die, it's included in my taxable estate, right? So somebody has a gazillion dollars, that's gonna be more estate taxes. Whereas if they converted that to a Roth and say, let's again, assume they're in 25% tax bracket, you'd only have $75,000 in the Roth to be in the taxable estate, it lowers your estate taxes. That part is all correct. Then they conclude, therefore, if you have a taxable estate, like you're over the 11.4 or whatever it is this year, you should do all Roth conversions. Um, that is not exactly correct. Because the person who inherits the IRD property, an IRA is income in respect of a decedent. It's, it's stuff that the decedent did not pay taxes on, so whoever inherits it has to pay the taxes, right? And you always know that, annuities, um, retirement plans, whatever. You take the money, you have to pay the taxes. So it's IRD property. There's actually an income tax deduction, Schedule A. Um, it's not, remember the 2% miscellaneous itemized deductions that went away? The line under that is other miscellaneous deductions not reduced by 2%. That line still exists. The amount of estate taxes attributable to the income tax, I'm sorry, attributable to the IRD property is a deduction on the beneficiary's income tax return as they take the money out. And, and so I can do the math, but I will spare you because this only applies to people who have taxable estates, which is not that many people anymore. But essentially, if everybody's in the same tax bracket, it's a tie because the person who inherited it got an income tax deduction for the amount of estate taxes that were paid. And if you trace it through, it makes it equivalent. However, it's not exactly equivalent because if you did it all the same year, it is the same dollars, but the person's only gonna get that income tax deduction as they take the money out. So somebody actually stretched the IRA. So you pay the estate taxes up front, but then you get the income tax benefit that's equivalent over the next 30 years. You're behind by the time value of money. So that's why I said the, the advice is correct, but for the wrong reason and in the wrong magnitude. You do net win, but you win by the amount of the time value of money on the stretch. So if the person's going to liquidate it the first year, it's a tie. Right. Um, currently, there are no required minimum distributions on Raws, which make Raws slightly better. Also, currently, there are no taxes on Roths, and I always like to point out, there is no guarantee that will not change in the future. Now, I think it's highly unlikely Roths will become fully taxable. That just seems too abusive. But I could easily foresee a world where there's a 5% or 10% surcharge on Roth withdrawals. I actually think Roths will end up with RMDs soon also. Next time they need to raise revenue, that will probably be on the list of things. Um, so people can't, can't keep it taxed free forever. There already are these heirs, as you know, but, um, and I, I'm assuming you guys followed this, the, the bill that passed the House, um, the Senate is expected to pass it before year end. There's no, no guarantees. The SECURE Act uh, removes the stretch, so everybody has 10 years taken out. 
So that's um, not, not great. So we'll see what happens with that. But at the moment, there's no RMDs on RAWs. Now, the future is a probability distribution. So I, I did this analysis a long time ago, and I've talked about it for years and years and years. And I was teaching a class of, of continuing education for CPAs down in Florida. And a young lady, uh, I, I talked about a lot of stuff with them. And you guys have only had me for like an hour. So you don't know it, the level of my nerdiness. Uh, but I have spreadsheets for every, I wrote our own Monte Carlo simulation retirement planning thing because I'm too cheap to buy software. Um, I wrote a Black Scholes option pricing model thing to value employee stock options. Um, just I have endless spreadsheets for everything. I even built our own RMD spreadsheet. And my partner's like, you know, it's like a hundred websites that do that. I go, now, I guess, but now we have a spreadsheet that doesn't do. <laughs> right? Um, so this young lady in class, I got done running through all the raw traditional factors. And she said, so do you have a spreadsheet that calculates which one's better? And, and this is going to sound stupid, right? I'll, I'll own that this sounds stupid. I was flabbergasted because I don't. And I don't know how that's possible because I have a spreadsheet for everything. <laughs> you know, I'll create a spreadsheet, the drop of a hat, and I didn't have one. And it puzzled me for days. Literally, I'm like, well, how do I not? Have, this is weird. And then I realized why I didn't. And it wasn't conscious. It was purely subconscious, but there's a reason I never built the spreadsheet. Because subconsciously, I knew I can't build a spreadsheet. Because remember, in the last session, I talked about, I think of the future as a probability distribution. There's many possible paths. And some of you could do really well, and some of you could do poorly. And it's okay to take money off the good one to fix the bad one with insurance and things like that. I really am used to thinking of the future as a probability distribution. And it's unknown. And all the calculators assume there is one possible future, and they ask you to specify the client's tax bracket in retirement as though that's a knowable number. I can't solve the problem because I need a Monte Carlo on the future, your multiple simulated paths, not just one. You don't pick one and go, well, that one worked. Let's go all in. Well, no, that's stupid. But I don't know how to specify the probability distribution. I don't know how to do... The expected, the mean, the standard deviation, the skewness, the kurtosis of the tax code <laughs> 30 years from now, right? Never mind the client, client situation you might sort of back into. The tax code, I have no way to handicap that one. So then I came up with a sort of good example to think about this. And this is how we really do it. So I need, uh, I need an example in the room. I'm going to use, I'm going to use Amy. Is that, your, is that yeah. Okay, Amy. Because Amy is clear, I think she is, I'm trying to find the youngest person in the room, and I think Amy, Amy wins. She's clearly like 25 or something like that. So <laughs> I've learned to never guess high. <laughs> she never gets at all. But for the sake of argument, let's assume that Amy is 20, let's assume, <laughs> assume that Amy's 25 years old and she sort of has her first sort of real job where she's uh, making pretty good money. Not a lot, but for a young person doing pretty well, she's making maybe $30,000, $40,000 a year, um, which feels pretty good to her. And her company has a 401k and she has a traditional 401k option or she has the Roth 401k option. She can do either one. And she comes to one of us as her financial advisor and says, which one should I do? Okay. Well, we have a, a secret advantage. We have a crystal ball that actually works. So we look in the crystal ball and we look at Amy's future and we say, wow, she's going to be really successful. She's going to you know, do really, really, really well. She's going to make a lot of money. She's going to be a very high tax bracket in retirement. She's going to have an estate tax problem, probably. So since we know that future, what advice would we give to 25-year-old Amy? The Roth, right? Clearly. Now, this would never be true, Amy. But suppose we looked in the crystal ball and she was not very successful. She had you know, business reversals and maybe health issues or divorces or whatever. And it turns out she's retired with very, very little money, very low tax bracket, which would have been the better advice to 25-year-old Amy? The traditional. Now here's the financial planning question. Which is it more important to improve, the bad case or the good case? The bad case. Most of financial planning is haircutting the good cases to fix the bad cases. That's why you don't buy all stocks all the time. That improves your good cases. It really kills your bad cases. It's why you don't skip on insurance. 
right? It improves your good cases where nothing burned down and nobody died. <laughs> nobody, nobody had a heart attack, you know, but it's really terrible in the bad cases. So most of financial planning is giving up upside to fix downside. It's sort of like, so you know, options, it's sort of like a collar, right? I'm selling a call, I'm buying puts. Most financial planning things sort of look like that. I'm trying to bring the tails in. I'll give up the outside to fix the downside. So since the future is a probability distribution and we don't know what's going to happen, the higher the level of uncertainty, the more I recommend the traditional IRA 401k products. I don't know where the person's going to be. I don't know where the tax code's going to be. I don't know what this is going to look like. So let me defer to the one or default to the one that does better in the worst cases, the one that's sort of safer, which is the deductible version. But then when clients get to be 60-ish, depends on the client, we will start doing partial Roth conversions to fill up what for that client is a low bracket, right? <laughs> different clients, you know, different situations. What's a low bracket for one client may not be for another one. But if somebody still has some room, right, in the 20, is it 20, there's a 24% bracket now? Some room in the 24% bracket, we might do the piece that fills up that piece all along especially if we get them to delay Social Security till age 70 and they retired at 65, so we've got a bunch of years with very low income. We can either um, recognize capital gains at a 0% rate, or we can do partial Roth conversions. There's a bunch of things you can do in those low bracket years to sort of uh, mitigate things. But that's what we, would, what we would tend to do. And we even have some clients that even though they're, they've hit their RMDs, we're still doing partial conversions. We've got a client that's got a $3 million IRA, um, and if he lives long enough, that's going to, or, and he's married, or if he or his wife dies, so they jump to the single brackets, single rates, their bracket's going to jump up. So we're still doing partial Roth conversions to try to reduce the chance that in the out years, they'll hit really, really high brackets. Okay. Questions? How much I did better that time, it leaves some time for questions. We will uh, open it up to questions, both to our virtual audience if you will, uh, in the chat section, add your question. Zach from Pulse Church will get those questions to us, but as those come into the queue and are faxed to me, we'll open it to the floor for the audience here, and uh, David, just repeat their questions so that yeah, all of our audience can hear that. So and, and questions be And before group. we take the first question, I will mention I have a, an email list that I accidentally started a dozen years ago for financial professionals. I emailed something to a couple of buddies and it sort of got out of hand. Um, and there's 3,000 people on the list now where every quarter I just email out the stuff I spent too, way much, too much time thinking about or things I thought were interesting. So I have a stack of cards at the front. If you want to be on that list, just go to my website. And on most pages of the website on the right-hand side, there's a place to sign up for that. I don't market to it. I don't do anything. It's just every quarter I share the stuff I'm already doing. So um, you're welcome to, to be on that. All right, questions? Yes, sir. Uh, you discussed how you refactor. Yes. Yeah, so the question was, I mentioned counting the mortgage as part of the asset allocation. Do I also consider the, the, the cash value of insurance in the asset allocation? The answer is yes. Um, and let me do a really quick example of this. We had a client, um, they didn't have insurance, but the concept of including everything, I think is a really, really important one. We had a client years ago, they were retired. I managed 100% of their portfolio and I had them 100% stocks. That sounds wrong, right? I've been an expert witness against advisors, right? For doing stupid things. It sounds like I should testify against me. <laughs> Here's the setup. Um, married couple, they had social security. That is, uh, you could do the present value of the social, expected social security benefits. That's all tips. That's treasury inflation protected securities. It's government guaranteed inflation protected. Um, they did not have a mortgage. So compared to somebody with a mortgage, they had a, a fixed income investment. Husband had a small pension, and it, it's not very much like $500 a month, but still, that's a fixed income investment, no COLA. And then the big one was they had sold a business and they held the note, and it was a 30-year mortgage on this business, and they got a nice down payment, so it was all well collateralized and everything. Um, that is also a fixed income investment. So the portfolio that was left is, was all stocks because everything else they had was so fixed income like. And yes, I would consider cash value and life insurance would also be a fixed income investment. I'm, well, I'm assuming in whole life insurance where it's invested in predominantly bonds and, and things like that. Yes, I would. 
Um, let me make one more point on that and then I'll, I'll take your question. Um, the other thing that people mess up on that, human capital, these folks are retired so it didn't apply. Human capital can apply. If you've got somebody who's 30 years old and they're a serial entrepreneur versus somebody who is a college professor and has tenure, what a lot of advisors do, I'm sure nobody in this room would, but what a lot of advisors do, well, the college professor, he's really conservative. So I've been a very conservative portfolio. And the entrepreneur, he's a risk taker. So we have the aggressive model for him. No, that is exactly backwards. They're human capital. One is bond-like and one is stock-like. You should offset with that with their portfolio, not exacerbate it. So anyway, go ahead. Back on mortgage. They pay extra, they want to pay extra on their mortgage. I asked them, is this your last home? Absolutely not. Then why are you doing that? To me, right. point that money elsewhere. Again, because yeah. so, equity isn't doing anything for them in the short term, and it's not like yeah, so let me for the for the folks online, let me see if I can simplify that question and maybe generalize it. He's got a case where young couples want to pay extra on their mortgage instead of doing other things. I think it simplifies. Not, not right. Okay. You should always fully fund your retirement plans. So I actually have on my blog, I've got two different posts. Um, one is optimal decumulation strategy and one is optional accumulation strategy and it actually ranks in order which things you should fund first. So let me see if you do it off the top of my head. Here's how you should save for optimal efficiency every time. First, you should do your employer's plan to the level of the match. Oh, unless the plans options are so incredibly sucky, I can't even imagine. But you should almost always do that to get the match. That's just free money. Second, if you have it available, you should do an HSA. And then you should pay your medical expenses out of pocket. Because the HSA, it's deductible on the front end like an IRA, and it's tax-free on the back end like a Roth for medical expenses. You can save your receipts and reimburse yourself in retirement. That's a sweet deal. And it's an emergency backup plan. If you actually have really high medical expenses, something really goes wrong in your life or your family, you've got that money sitting there. So that's a great second option. Third option, IRAs. Because the investment options there can be really, really good. Right? You can buy whatever you want. Next option, I forgot what number I'm on. I'm back, I've now maxed out the IRAs. Now I'm back to the employer's plan. I already did the full match. Now I'm doing all the way to the limit. Right? The reason that's ranked down there is the investment options are almost always less good than what you could get in an IRA. So you do the IRA ahead of that, and then you do the employer plan. Then you're on to taxable investments because you run out of all the stuff. And that's where you get into, should I pay down my mortgage? Um, should I buy muni bonds? You know, what's my asset allocation? We do, I'm not going to do it here because it takes too long. But asset location strategy, put the most efficient things in the right bucket. I've got some papers on that on the website too. So that's how I would do that. Or so, I, so the, the pay extra on the mortgage is way down to after you've exhausted all the tax advantage stuff. The other not, thing that I think is underappreciated about the retirement plans, because I'm always thinking about these tail risks, is the creditor protection. You know, uh, you guys don't have, a, a, what's the homestead protection on somebody going bankrupt? Do they get the house? Like Florida and Texas, the house is completely protected. But in most states, it's not or some really tiny level. So if those folks had a terrible car accident and exceeded their umbrella liability policy, they would not lose their 401k or their IRA, but they would lose their house. So I really like the, the order for that, too. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Right. So, so, right. So where does cash value insurance fall into place? I think for cash value insurance to, to, to make sense, you need, there's, I'm trying to think, it's five or six factors, if I can do this off the top of my head. I've got a blog post on this too. You don't need all of these factors to be true, but you need sort of a preponderance. You need sort of a weighting. One, somebody has to need insurance anyway, right? If, you're, if that makes more sense if you need insurance. Two, you have to never, 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 never need the money. In other words, you have so much money, this really is for the next generation. Because the insurance illustrations, and I, I, I'm probably going to step on toes, I apologize in advance. But there's no Monte Carlos in insurance at all. 
it assumes a fixed rate of return that goes forever and there's no blow up risk whatsoever. And if you could do a Monte Carlo on that, I think the odds of, of a lot of those policies where people are saying, well, you'll fund this and then you'll borrow against it to live on in retirement. The failure rate on those, I think subjectively, because you can't do the math, is really high. But in the case where this really is for the next generation, that's cool. Third thing, your fixed income is overflowed your deferred account. So we're talking about asset location strategy. If I have ordinary income property that's in my taxable account that's very inefficient, if I can throw an insurance wrapper around that to defer it forever and then make it tax-free on death, that's great. That's the next factor. You have to believe that the life insurance death benefit being tax-free will still exist at the point of your death. And that seems likely, but it's not 100%. And people want to argue with me about that, but you don't understand insurance pay, companies pay a lot of money on lobbyists and blah, 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 right? And if you had suggested in the 1970s that Social Security would become taxable, they would have laughed you out of the room. Are you kidding? Old people vote. So I'm just saying this, it's not a 0% chance that this whole, and most of the advantage of the cash value rides on that, but it'll be tax-free someday. If that changes, it really messes it up. Um, I think that's most of the factors. The other thing that I really, really, really like for me personally and for clients, is I love optionality. I wanna be able to change my mind if the client situation changes or the world changes or whatever. And I just dislike as a general rule, things where I'm locked in for long periods of time. And so I don't like hedge funds. I don't like a lot of the permanent insurance. And yes, you have cases that are really, really clear where the client's never gonna need the money because they're worth a gazillion dollars. Perfect, they could do that. But cases where somebody might need the money and the world is uncertain, I wanna be able to take a mulligan and undo it. So that's sort of my perspective on it. Other questions? Half the room hates me now. <laughs> we do not have any other questions coming in at this point. So let's hear it for David. Thank you very much. Thank you. For those uh, in the room as well as those participating virtual, we appreciate your attendance. And with that, we'll turn it back to Zach. Perfect. So we will take a short break while they set up lunch. All right. Well, thank you, Brad. And uh, once again, thank you, David. And thanks to all who have participated in today's NAFA Live. Um, I have our last and final polling question for today. Um, and that is, what is the name of today's presenter? I'll repeat that. What is the name of today's presenter? Now, don't forget to mark your calendar for the next meeting on September 13th, taking place at the NAFA Performance Plus Purpose Conference and featuring Danny O'Connell presenting how to turn your successful practice into a balanced personal life. If you haven't registered for P plus P yet, there's still time. Just visit conference.nafa.org. That's conference.nafa.org. And if you missed that, you can always reach out to us and we'll be happy to provide that link to you. For those of you who have joined us virtually today, this concludes our program. And for those who are participating from area viewing location watch parties, we turn you back to your local meeting and encourage you to continue the discussion. So have a great day, everybody.